Austin. This is my very first trip, and I am delighted to be here. So thank you all for coming out this morning. South by Southwest has really done a lot for women's health this year, and I'm, I'm so excited that She Media uh, has taken the time to really allow women to come together and share experiences, and that's what we're going to dive into today. Sharon, what do you think we should talk about first? Well, let me see. Hmm. <laughs> I think we should talk about menopause because I think the reason why we're having this conversation is that we want to give you all the information that you need to empower you such that when you see your physician or whomever you get your care from, you have all the information that you need. And I think we, when you're telling a story, probably the best part, the best place to start is at the beginning. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about where it all starts with perimenopause. And for those of you who are really not familiar with the term, peri just simply means around the menopause. And that's a very unhelpful term. Around, if you say something is around the corner, well, is it two blocks or is it two miles? <laughs> I don't know. And that's sort of what the problem is with perimenopause. It is unhelpful because you don't know exactly when it starts or when it's going to end. So let me give you a few guidelines about perimenopause. Even though we in medicine often think of perimenopause starting with some menstrual irregularities, they may, they may not, but there is the whole host of symptoms that we normally associate with menopause can happen in perimenopause. And let me just say, it happens earlier than you think and it lasts longer than you think. So I think familiarizing yourself with the symptoms such as, and Dr. Uh, Jessica and I are going to just run through a few of the top 10, I think, symptoms that are associated with perimenopause. Everybody knows hot flashes. Night sweats, which really is kind of the, the nighttime feature for hot right. sweats, right? Like it never ends, it's around the clock. What's another symptom? Irritability, anxiety, mood swings, and mood disorders. I'm going to list the one that I actually fe uh, featured first in perimenopause, which was mind fog, just brain fog and not really being able to multitask in memory. So that was one that I experience still. Weight gain, but weight gain not typically in the way that you think of weight gain. And I think that we, there's some debate about whether or not you gain weight or you don't. The reality is you gain weight when you age and your metabolism slows down as you get older, so the things that worked for you at 20 will not work for you at 40. Just heads up. FYI. But, <laughs> but how that weight is distributed changes, and I think that when you gain the weight, the one thing that you don't get the chance to do is decide where it goes. And a lot of that weight gain that you put on during the perimenopause and menopausal years really sort of takes up residence between your neck and what used to be your waistline. Used to be, keyword used to be. And then sleep disturbances. I think that a lot of my patients come in and really connecting the dots on all the different symptoms. And like you said before, perimenopause really is this exploratory zone in where you're starting to see changes in your body, your symptoms, how you function. And so really putting the pieces together is what I would say is better way to get ready for menopause than waiting for menopause to hit and kind of like hitting a wall at full speed. Right, and, and I think that there are some things that we don't associate with menopause, like itchy skin, itchy ears, tinnitus. There are all of these things, and I say this to say, we're not gonna, we could spend all evening talking about- We could doing symptoms for this all entire panel. <laughs> but I say this to say that perimenopause is a clinical diagnosis. And by that, I mean you're in perimenopause when you say you're in perimenopause. If you are within the ages of usually 40 and 50, and you have any of those symptoms in combination or alone, you're in perimenopause. If you have none of those sy symptoms and you are between the ages of 40 and 50, you're still in perimenopause. <laughs> so don't believe the hype when people tell you, oh, menopause, I didn't do that. Yes, you did, and yes, you will. <laughs> menopause is mandatory. For those of us who are born with ovaries, at some point in time, those ovaries will stop working. And this would be a good time to, for you, Jessica, to tell us a little bit what happens. All right, so you've managed this perimenopausal mm -hmm. phase, which may last anywhere from four to 10 years, by the way. Then you get to menopause. How do you know when you're in menopause? 
Yeah, menopause, I feel, is just a very clinical term. It's just a way that doctors like to talk to each other to be able to say, I know that this woman does not has not had periods or cycles for 12 months consecutively. That's really all it means technically in the sense of what information am I giving to someone else that they can understand where that woman is in that journey. Because that entire journey of perimenopause and menopause really, now that we've said what, three to 10 years for uh, perimenopause, and menopause typically symptoms can last up to 12 years. So that's a good chunk of time when you put them together. So menopause really is a clinical term to just help understand that you have now gone 12 months without a cycle because right after that, you were postmenopausal. So I like to call menopause the birthday that no one's really wanting, but <laughs> is going to happen. Um, and after that, you know, we spend 40% 40, 40 of our lives are spent in the postmenopausal phase. So that's why we're really trying to use this time to help you understand the transition, the journey, and what tools you can use, specifically with the, uh, the panel that was two before, about looking at healthy hormones and how you can template that for yourself to understand how do I individually go through this, what am I experiencing, and what can I foretell for my journey to come. Right, and one of the things that I want women to really understand is even though your journey may be individual, as I said, some people have all of the symptoms, some have none. But I think that as long as you have a general idea of what to expect when you enter this phase, and as I said, for some women, it may, you may enter this perimenopausal phase in your early 30s. It's more common in your 40s. But if you know that's coming, you'll at least know how to address these issues when you get them. And don't spin your wheels and go out looking for doctors who are trying to cure one thing or another, one symptom at a time. Understand that it all falls under the rubric of the menopausal transition and menopause. And the other thing I, I like, I, I take a little bit of issue with the term postmenopausal because when you say you're postmenopausal, it implies that you're over it. And I would oh, say no way over it. the next, <laughs> you were the next 40 years, if you're lucky, of your life will be spent in those menopausal years. So think of it as an active, ongoing phase of your life, not something that you're going to get over and, oh, we're done with that. It's not over. It's not over. It's not over till it's over. But I will say, I wanted to share a story about why this is so important that we spend time talking about this. One, I think it really takes a lot of touches and conversations and discussions for women to truly understand where they fall, understanding the biology behind it, and understanding that there's a lifestyle that's going to have to start in the perimenopausal phase, in the menopausal phase, and the not postmenopausal, but postmenopausal phase. Um, but I wanted to share a story, particularly about a patient who came in to see me, and she was in her early 40s, so somewhere between 42 and 44. Now, with this particular patient, she was starting to have symptoms, and she'd seen another doctor, and they weren't quite getting the pieces together of why she was feeling this way. So. I got labs and you know to help her understand and to see if there was something else going on to rule out anything else. And from it, when I heard her story, they were very indicative of perimenopausal symptoms. And I said, well, it seems as if you probably are entering your perimenopausal journey. And we went through the, the symptoms and she burst out in tears. And I was like, oh my God, what did I say? That was really triggering. Um, and when I asked her, I said, what is bringing you to tears because I wanna help you in this moment and help you understand? And her answer was is that she misunderstood what perimenopause was and she thought I was saying she was menopausal. And for her, that was kind of like the end of the road. She didn't wanna get there and I really had to take that time to share and educate and help her understand that had nothing to do with menopause. It was just this journey that she had now entered and how to embrace it, but also how I could help her. So I think our job as healthcare providers and physicians and menopause experts, in addition to knowing the science, is really to help each and every woman who we see and encounter and how we educate and use these platforms to make sure that every woman feels that they're heard and that they're, they feel that they're going to have the tools that they're gonna need. Right, and I think that part of our job as well is to remove the stigma. There is nothing wrong with being perimenopausal or menopausal, but I do understand that there are implications, particularly for women who enter this phase younger because they had anticipated that they had more time. 
And something that we don't talk a lot about during perimenopause and why that's important and why it's important for you to have these intergenerational conversations with your mother, with your aunties, because being in perimenopause also affects your fertility. When you're in menopause, it signals the end of your fertility, but in perimenopause, it is a relative decline in your fertility that you start to see. And imagine for someone, uh, a young woman who is in her 30s and she thought she had time, and you have to confront the reality that this is where we are. And I think that this is particularly important in this day and time because I was looking at the CDC, CDC statistics, the age at first birth has never been higher in this country. And for women, I, I say that to say no shame, no pressure, but you should just take that into account. You should ask your mother, well, how old were you when you had your first baby? What, did you have difficulty getting pregnant? Because these are all just data points for helping women to take control of their health, their fertility, and knowing how to deal with that. Now, we've talked a lot about menopause and the perimenopausal journey. And I want to really talk to you, uh, Jessica, because we are of different generations. And what I would like to know is what you were taught when you went through training mm -hmm. about menopause and how to deal with it. Yeah, I think going through residency, and even now we have statistic on how much time is actually spent in residency on menopause as that journey and condition, and not much time is spent there. So we know the biology of it, but the management and the treatment and the options and lifestyle is something that is not really truly shared. I think we know a lot now more with science, but when I was going through residency, it really was focusing on waiting until they had reached that menopausal phase of having the 12 months without a period before I could do anything. So many women, and it makes my heart sad to think of all the women who are probably in the perimenopausal phase and really having some severe issues, whether that were hot flashes, night sweats, et cetera, and I was unable to help them because that's what was taught. So I think now as we're entering this time frame and truly understanding the journey as a continuum rather than separate chapters, they really do bleed into each other. That was a pun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, I think that now that we are able to say from the data, from the physiology, from the lifestyle portion of it and what goes on metabolically in your body, putting that all together, we are well advanced in that now. I think you won't see that in training for maybe a few, uh, hopefully not another decade, but shortly. But when I was training, it was we had to wait until they didn't have any more periods before suggesting any hormone replacement therapy. But as we were talking the other day, I was actually training right at the time that the WHI uh, results came out and we really had to thwart away from even recommending hormones. So we went from a time frame right as I was starting training to have to wait till a woman was finished her entire menstrual cycle, even if she had one bleed in 11 months, I'm like, gotta restart that clock, which is horrible for her. And then we would give hormones, um, but then right in the middle of training is right when we had to stop um, and we really pushed away from giving hormone replacement therapy or giving those recommendations. Right, and, and this is where, one of those few situations where being old is helpful. Um, when I trained, I had trained for 10 years before the Women's Health Initiative came out. And for those of you who don't know, I won't bore you with the details, but it is the study that is that I think has poisoned the well on hormone replacement therapy more than anything else that we've done in decades. That study put the idea in women's head that estrogen is bad for you, it's gonna give you breast cancer, and it doesn't help. But let me just say this, from the 10 years of experience that I had had treating women prior to this study coming out, we were actually using estrogen not just to treat the symptoms of menopause, because I think that the important thing that you should know is that it is the most effective treatment for the symptoms of menopause. Period, end of sentence. And yes, pun was intended as well. <laughs> um, but when it comes, we were also using and using data from what is called the nurses, the Framingham study, which is the nurses study where they actually just observed nurses. They said, oh, well, let's take some healthy women and just follow them, ask them a few questions over the years and see what their health outcomes are. And what they found was that the nurses in that study who took hormone 
therapy had half the risk of heart disease than nurses who did not. And so that was how I entered the discussion of hormone therapy, should we use it, should we not? Because we were doing it not just to improve symptoms, but we were actually advocating for it because we thought that this is going to decrease the risk of heart disease in women. And for those of you who don't know, heart disease was then and is still now the number one killer of women. More women die of heart disease each year than all cancers combined. So while we are fearful of breast cancer, I think we shouldn't be fearful of it. We should be vigilant about it. And I think what came out of that study, and I think what was so damaging, was it cemented this notion in women's minds and in doctors' minds that estrogen causes breast cancer. And if you take nothing more away from this conversation today, I want you to leave here to say, estrogen does not cause breast cancer. And so if that's the reason, if that's the fear that you have, I want, to, I want you to take it out of your mind because we're gonna talk about some options of what to do during perimenopause, and also during menopause, and don't let the fear factor get in the way of making good decisions that make sense for you. And by the same token, don't let a doctor gatekeep you out of something that you know that you need, and that's why we're here, because we want you to know your options, we want you to know how to advocate for yourself when you get into that situation and you need them. So let's talk, this would be a good time to talk about treatment options. So. Jessica, let's talk about treatment options during, well, first, I'll go back. Before we talk about treatment, lifestyle, because yes. that's important as well. That was going to be my first treatment that's option. Right. Okay. <laughs> no, I am a firm believer. Um, you know, I have a, a background in kinesiology and physiology, so I've always been aware of truly how the body can work for you and what it does as we start to age. I like to put menopause and aging sometimes in two different buckets that have a lot of overlap, and the reason is there, things just happen because we're aging. Now, we do have some complexities when we do go through menopause because of the decline in estrogen, which somewhat uh, accelerates the aging process. But in all of that is, what can I do as an individual? What can I do in my everyday life that's going to maximize my quality of life in the End. And I think that's where lifestyle really plays into how you can do that every day, whether it's taking extra steps, whether it's I'm going to learn how to properly weight train and incorporate weights into my, my algorithm for exercise, how I'm going to, I heard this on another panel, how I'm going to use the data that I have for myself and individualize and personalize that into a lifestyle and the foods that we eat. I think what, when you explained about the WHI and what came out of that was really to the heart of it, true marketing. What marketing can do, whether it's good marketing or bad marketing, in this instance it was bad, that really has pervaded a 20 year history of women's health and we're really trying to turn that page. And so when we look at food and nutrition in the Western diet has really, again, crippled us into what our bodies as machines can do. So you have to look at it from a perspective of, what are the things that I can take responsibility for? And what are those small steps that I can do, whether it's with lifestyle, weight training, and nutrition? Right, and I want to make this abundantly clear. As you enter perimenopause, lifestyle matters. Lifestyle, and the things that we're talking, we're talking basic. This isn't requiring any you know, heavy equipment or <laughs> expensive trainers. It just means moving, getting yeah. a good diet, getting a good night's sleep. This, these changes matter whether you're talking about how you are going to enter perimenopause and menopause, cancer prevention, heart attack and stroke prevention, all of these things. So we're not going to even take these lifestyle things out of context and say just do it for menopause. Do it for the rest of your life exactly. for those health benefits. And as we talk about perimenopause, and this is something that's a little bit different for me even that I learned, even though I was, you know, fully trained in the benefits of hormone therapy, is what to do with those women during perimenopause. Now, I'm gonna tell you this. So I just told you, oh, well, perimenopause is a time of relative infertility. It's not gone, but it's heading in that direction. But I said relative because I can tell you for sure that women who are in that perimenopausal phase can and do get pregnant. 
And yours truly is living proof of that because... <laughs> She's sharing her experience. <laughs> because my mother, I'm, who was a month shy of her 45th birthday, gave birth to yours truly. And even though I would like to think that it was such a pleasant surprise, I bet it wasn't. <laughs> my next sibling was seven years older than me, and I bet she was hoping for menopause, and here you go. So I say in that perimenopausal phase, you know, oral contraceptives have a role to play. So you can use them both for relief of some of the menopausal symptoms. And if you need contraception, if you need cycle control, because that's something else that happens during perimenopause is you can get these wild, crazy, out of control periods, birth control pills work beautifully for that. And what we didn't use when we were doing this. We used birth controls almost exclusively. Mm -hmm. We never entertained the thought that you could use menopausal hormone therapy during perimenopause. Which so is interesting because when you look at the dynamics of both of them, um, putting someone on birth control later on in life actually increases their risk for more morbidity and mortality when we think of clots, when we think of heart uh, issues. So it actually is. But only, not as but only in women who are unhealthy. Correct. For healthy, for healthy women, they can take, you can take birth control pills. That's one of my strategies. Take it straight up until you, are you done? I think 55 or 50 is a good time to stop. And you can go seamlessly directly into, into menopausal HRT. hormone therapy. So the difference between what we, <clears throat> excuse me, what we caution for birth control pills is different because menopausal hormone therapy is a quarter to half the dose of even the lowest dose birth control. I wanted to give a story. I love giving stories. Can you tell us? It's a story time. Um, and really how lifestyle can factor into whether someone decides to do hormone replacement therapy or not. <laughs> and one thing I really wanted to help everyone here understand and every, anyone who might be listening is although we're at this point where we're really emphasizing just how important HRT and hormone replacement therapy or menopause hormone therapy is at this juncture because we're trying to turn that page, it is also not to villainize anyone who chooses not to take menopause hormone therapy or HRT. And I think that's important. We saw something similar when you think about breastfeeding and bottle feeding when we were trying to change the narrative, then everyone was like, well, if I bottle feed, am I a bad person? And so I wanted to make sure that everyone understood that. But that's, again, why lifestyle is so important into how you can dictate or prepare the journey for life and for aging is because I've had patients who have had very severe symptoms in the perimenopausal phase. And one thing that I really focus on is how can we tweak or how can we make these subtle changes in lifestyle to give you the benefit of some of these symptoms and many of my patients have been able to minimize uh, whether it's severity or intensity and frequency of hot flashes just with movement, just with changing some of the ways that they conceptualize diet and eat, even through meditation and yoga. And so really looking at them as a different perspective and finding how I can do this, you too can change that narrative of what perimenopause and the menopause journey can look like for you. And the one thing that I really want women to understand, because this happens amongst our friends, is there's some menopause shaming going on. And that someone uh, is like church lady. I guess that makes me <laughs> superior. You know, I didn't have symptoms, so you sh and I got through this process without needing anything. You should too. And girl, if you can't, that must mean that you are inferior. You're weak. If you only did X, Y, Z, you too could have my journey. And I say to anyone who can get through this and does not need hormones, I wouldn't give you, I wouldn't give you high blood pressure medication if you didn't have high blood pressure. If you don't need it, you don't want it, that's not my job to say that you must. I want you to have information and you can decide for yourself because that same person who may not have menopausal symptoms may be at high risk for osteoporosis. So there's some things there, other reasons why we might need them, and something that just about every woman will have, whether you have symptoms or not, is the genital urinary syndrome of menopause. And you don't really connect the dots because it happens sometimes for women well after they've completed menopause, and they think, oh, again, 
I'm postmenopausal. I'm done with that. And the reality is, is that the effects that it has, menopause has, and the lack of estrogen on your bones and on your genital urinary system, such that painful, dry vaginas, urinary frequency, urgency, and frequent urinary tract infections, those are really serious consequences of the lack of estrogen. So even though you might not need systemic hormones, using topical or local vaginal, uh, vaginal estrogen for most women is a good idea. So don't, you know, so we're, we're here to give you the entire array of your options about how to deal with menopause. And the more you know, the more empowered you are when you see your physician, if you are not offered these options, then you bring it up. We have found that there's some realities we've got to confront here about medicine. Um, and everyone says, oh, do you know a great doctor that I can see and talk to about this? And I said, well, yeah, but the wait's six months. Or there may not be anyone in your area who knows how to treat menopause. Then what are you to do? And this is why I think that we have got to get out of this paradigm uh, in medicine of thinking that care has to be delivered one-on-one. -on -one. You come to my office, take a half day off, pay for parking, you're pissed off because I'm late. You know, that whole, that whole thing has, has really got to shift. And if there is anything that COVID has taught us mm -hmm. is that there are different ways to deliver care that are more efficient and effective for you and for the physician. Well, I don't and think they could get an appointment because all of us are here. All of the <laughs> menopause experts are here. That's true. No they one could not get an appointment, get an appointment today. Um, <laughs> but this is where I say, you know, telehealth is important because you can use, and yes, full disclosure, I'm the medical advisor for Alloy Women's Health, but <clears throat> I joined them because they do the thing, they are able to do the things more efficiently Oh, leveraging the expertise of a few over many that no matter how many patients I saw, I'd never be able to get to. And, <clears throat> excuse me, talk too much. There are, there are people who are out there who are educating women, and you know, there's a lot on the internet, so you don't know who to believe and who not to believe, but we have some of our preeminent experts here, Dr. Mary Claire Haver, we have Dr. Kelly Casperson, and, and many other women that we would be happy to share those resources such that if we don't get to everything today, that's okay. These are people who are gonna give you good, solid information such that you can take that information, do with it, do with it what you will, but when you see your provider, if you have one, you have in mind what your options are and what you wanna do. At the end of all of this, it's options. How can we give you as many options as possible? One thing I wanted to leave you with before we do some questions and answers is that many of the features of menopause can appear as if they're uh, external. So when we talk about hot <coughs> flashes and night sweats or vaginal dryness um, or sleep is to also consider those in addition to the things that are going on in your body that you may not see. And so you have this camp, like you were talking about earlier, of like, well, I didn't necessarily have the outward experiences of menopause. But when I think of the three probably biggest uh, organ systems in the body that are impacted by menopause is going to be your heart, your bones, and your brain. And so those are changes that are occurring from even from as early as 35 when we start to see the decline in how our bodies um, metabolize and how they operate is that those things are also being impacted as we start to age. And so that's why it's imperative that this message is for everybody. It's not just for the few people who might have hot flashes or the few people who might have dry vaginas. That sounded really good, <laughs> the few people. But I do think that we have to look at it comprehensively. I think that everyone is going through this experience. I've heard before and I truly believe that Menopause is not only going to impact 50% of women, it's going to impact 100% of women, but your story may be different, may appear different, but in the end, how do I want to show up later on in life means that we have to reconceptualize what this is, what this journey is, and how you're going to approach it. So I hope that, hope that everything that you've heard for the entire weekend into today is really helping you right now, but also, Anyone that you know, whether that's your friend or your family, you share this information. This is how we get this information out and change that narrative and change the paradigm. 
themselves. And, and share this information with younger women because the time to really intervene and have the most impact is to start early. And I use this analogy all the time, but you would never discuss a, with, to, with a young girl her period after she's gotten it. There, there would be a horrifying experience, and, and unfortunately, that is how we let women enter menopause, with no information, only when they are seeking and desperate for care. Are there so, any questions for anything that you can think of? Yes, we have a question right here. <clears throat> Yeah, so the question was regarding hormone therapy and migraines. That's such a great question, specifically with migraines with aura. Um, I suffer from migraines personally um, and sometimes have aura with them. But there actually is data that's more recent data. Now, typically, uh, people who had migraines or headaches, we really stayed away from uh, giving them um, estrogen or any hormone therapy. There is newer data that has come out in the, towards the end of 2021 from uh, the neurology side of it of looking at actually how the fluctuation, the steep fluctuations of estrogen is more of the cause of why you're seeing more headaches in women going through perimenopause and menopause. And looking into that in a reason of why actually normalizing the levels of uh, estrogen will prevent some of those headaches. So I think that there is room for hormone therapy for women who are suffering from migraines, but it has to be done under the guidance of someone who truly understands the origin of the headache looking at the levels of where the woman is in her journey with perimenopause and menopause, and seeing if there possibly is the reason for the fluctuations and the deep, steep uh, dive of estrogen that they're having. Because if you actually talk to women who have migraines, if you actually track when their migraines occur, that's another way to find out when are they specifically happening and is this due to a hormonal reason? And what might your provider, your OBGYN, be able to do, or your uh, PCP, your primary care, to see is the restoration of estrogen in hormone therapy going to alleviate the migraines? Um, but and I'm going to say this because there is a difference, and I want to make it very Correct. clear, between birth control pills and menopausal hormone therapy. As I said, menopausal hormone therapy is a quarter of the dose. It can be used transdermally and is not a contraindication for women who have uh, migraines, even migraines with aura. The number of contraindications to hormone replacement therapy are actually quite few. And menopausal hormone therapy, and here is something that, again, I learned later in life, believe it or not, smoking is not a contraindication to hormone therapy. Now, no one should smoke now. Though, let's make that clear. <laughs> she's but, not advocating for smoking. But That's the not what same, she said. <laughs> but the same, the things that we say for birth control pills, and, and that is a contraindication for birth control pills, is not a contraindication contraindication for menopausal hormone therapy. Any other questions? Yes, we have one right over here. Um, but I should be, I should be considering uh, my ovarian health and extending that health for lifespan to affect what you said, brain, heart, bones, and there's more apparently. So I should be I should be looking for ways to potentially intervene at this time. That is, you like put that right into, that was the perfect question. Like you have been here and listening. I love this. <laughs> Everyone give her a round of applause because that the way that she actually formulated that question was Beautiful. Looking at ovarian longevity and how to uh, increase that in order to sustain lifespan, right? And how to do that well. And if you're having symptoms, I love that you said you're three months and it may be it. You're like, three months without, I'm almost there. Um, but we still have a few more to go. So I'll check up on you in a few months. But looking at that is how, again, how do I look at hormone therapy? How do I look at lifestyle in order to looking at it from an organ system of how do I sustain ovarian function as much as I can, but also in conjunction with that, how can I help my heart, my bones, and my brain? So I think that that's the conversation that's how you start and figuring out from that where you are, what options are available, and which ones are going to work well for you individually. 
That was a great question. Right, and the one thing I would say too for women, particularly for women who are symptomatic, there is no virtue in waiting because what we do know, and even from that flawed women's health initiative is that there is a window of opportunity. So the earlier you start, the more of your bone mass you preserve, the more of your muscle you preserve, the less fat you deposit. So there is, I, and I use this example all the time, it's like people who are having a baby and then they're like, no, 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 I'm gonna, I'm not gonna get an epidural. I'm like, Were you and there when I had, that's what I did. And then I didn't get very far. I was like, who is on today for anesthesia? No. But, but, but let me say, and I look at people and I'm going, oh, you're going to be here for a while. And they go, no, no, no. And then they get to eight centimeters 12 hours later and they get the epidural. And all I can say is, you could have had it like 12 hours ago. Yeah. But, you, you don't, know. you don't get a medal for you. suffering. You, do, you don't get them. There's no medals or awards no, for suffering no at parts. the end of it. Absolutely not. A question right here. Yes. Thank you. The correlation between um, your your insulin levels, your glucose levels, your like. So I am on HRT, and I have been for the last three months. But my um, A1C continues to go up, and so I'm trying to figure out, you know, what is that whole? What is what is well, all I would, that about? You, did you say that you wear the monitor? No, no. Um, I started hormone replacement therapy a, oh, few, a okay. few months ago. So there so are actually multiple ways. The question was in regards to uh, insulin and glucose and how that uh, relationship shifts is, again, it has to do with estrogen. So you have estrogen receptors all over your body. And so when you look at your gut and your pancreas, they also have estrogen receptors. So when you start to see that decline, that's where you see, one, with muscle, not being able to absorb glucose as much, but also the utility of how insulin is able to work in that relationship, which before it used to be a very beautiful relationship, right? So that comes with aging as well. So the insulin is not able to uh, work with the glucose as well and get it shuttled into the liver where it stores it. So the goal really is if you're taking HRT, one, I would say don't make sure that you know that this is the long game, right? So this is a marathon. So your, your hemoglobin A1C may be creeping up, so there may be other factors that are causing it to increase. So again, looking at lifestyle, what are some things that I can implement into my lifestyle that might help my insulin glucose ratio, looking at the foods that you take? Those are like really small things that when you start to make those changes, you do start to see that decrease. So hormone replacement therapy is going to be good in the long run for helping that relationship with insulin and glucose but implementing some of those small key things also into your daily life is also going to help it. So not looking at it as, okay, I'm gonna do a month and see what my hemoglobin A1C is, because that's a reflection of previous sugar levels, is saying, I'm going to do these things and I'm going to see how I'm gonna be at six months, nine months, a year, and giving yourself grace. Make sure that you give yourself grace. This is not a sprint, mm -hmm. it's a marathon, but taking the steps and taking them consistently being able to sustain them is gonna get you where exactly where you need to get. And finding a provider who truly understands the relationship metabolically of insulin and glucose in regards to perimenopause and menopause is crucial. We have time for one very quick question. If someone has a very quick one. Yes. Oh. oh. Awesome. Can you talk about just the difference or your recommendations between an estrogen cream, like a compound cream versus a patch? Now, see, that's a quick question. That's not a quick question. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was quick in my head. We're so going to restart a, the entire panel right. all and over again. You know what? And, and we will, you know, we'll be around for a little bit so we can maybe answer some of these, but we're out of time. I needed a I yes want to give a no. quick answer. I think that you there know? are options. I want to say, because that's a great question that can have a long answer. The end goal is that there are options and you do not have to take necessarily what someone tells you to take if it doesn't feel right for you, but know your options. There's differences, but there's also strengths and benefits to each of them. Okay, thank, thank you. you so 